No matter what else is happening in the world. There is always good news today. Welcome to Good News Today, the program where you will always find good news no matter what else is happening in the world. I'm Mark Teske, your host for Good News Today. I want to thank you for joining us. We've got a great episode today. Here's what's coming up. We'll begin with our devotional time, and that consists of our scripture reading, beautiful singing, and a brief study of that scripture. Today, we'll be looking at Hebrews 6, verses 4 through 6, a passage where we read that it's impossible for some people to be forgiven. So get out your Bibles, turn to Hebrews 6. I'll meet you there in just a moment. Following our devotional time, we head over to the workshop where Troy Spradlin is working away to repair our understanding about Luke 18. Does the prayer of the tax collector teach the sinner's prayer as it's practiced today? Jim Dearman will join us with some sound words about silliness, stupidity, and sin. Then we head over to the pastime porch for a visit with Joe Guy. He's bringing us some more truths from the timeless text as he talks about useless knowledge. Chad Dalahite joins us for just a minute, and he's got some thoughts about the flight of sin. In our final segment, we have a Bible question for Anthony Dismuke and Troy Spradlin. What's the difference between a public sin and a private sin? As you can see, we're dealing with the subject of sin in this episode. I hope you have your Bible and something to take notes with so that you can see these things for yourself. I also hope you have your Bibles opened up to Hebrews 6, where we read, beginning at verse 4. For it is impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away, to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and put Him to an open shame. The book of Hebrews was written for Jewish Christians who were at risk for falling away from Christianity and going back into Judaism. The Hebrew writer has just scolded them at the end of chapter 5 for not maturing. They were still babes and they needed to grow in the faith. So he's highlighting a significant need for spiritual growth. And that brings us to our passage today. It's often misunderstood. Uh, people have really had a difficult time with this. And to help us understand it, we're going to look at it in individual parts and then put all those parts together. So as we're looking at the text, there's different phrases that are used here. Those who were once enlightened, those who have tasted the heavenly gift, partakers of the Holy Spirit, tasted the Word of God, the power of the ages to come, all those different Poetic descriptions point to the fact that these people were Christians. These are not people who are outside of Christ. These are people who have been enlightened. They have tasted the heavenly gift. They have partaken in the Holy Spirit. They have tasted the Word of God. 
and the power of the ages to come. These are all descriptions showing that they were Christians. Now, some false teachers who would deny this truth, uh, they try to tell you that these are not Christians. But the text is pretty clear here. It's talking about Christians. And he says, if these Christians fall away, well, why would he warn, about, warn them about something that's not a possibility? Falling away is indeed possible. It's a major theme of the book of Hebrews. Back in chapter 2, verse 3, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Talking to Christians. Hebrews chapter 10, 29 through 31, warning Christians of punishment if they turn away from Christianity. Verse 30 makes it very clear. The Lord will judge His people. So this warning about falling away comes after a warning about not growing as Christians. The Holy Spirit has inspired the writer to encourage continual spiritual growth. And the recipients of this letter were being tempted to turn away from Christ and go back into Judaism. Uh, they weren't growing in their faith. And he says here, those who turn away, they're crucifying again the Son of God, putting Him to an open shame. These are continuing, ongoing actions in the original language, the Greek. These are people who continue doing these things. These would be sins that would be evident if they walked away from Christianity and went back and embraced Judaism again. They would be uh, very visibly ignoring the sacrifice of Jesus on a continuing basis. And the writer says, it's impossible to renew them again to repentance. This is an absolute. Uh, it, it's as harsh and as clear as it sounds. And it should serve as a stern warning to those readers as well as to us. It is impossible. So those who have been Christians can reach a state of being impossible for them to be renewed. That should get our attention. So as we put all this together, if a Christian, somebody who meets those qualifications, one who's in Christ, keeps on sinning, keeps on rejecting the sacrifice of Jesus, it's impossible to bring them back. It's impossible to get to heaven in that condition, continually rejecting the sacrifice of Jesus. So as we seek to make application of this, don't believe that lie, once saved, always saved. It contradicts the clear, plain teaching of Scripture. That's a lie straight from Satan. We have a need for growth. The Hebrew writer is sandwiches this between discussions of growing in your Christianity. So we need to make sure we focus on that. Don't walk away from Jesus and His church. That may seem obvious, and the ramifications are pretty clear here. But I've heard some pretty poor excuses for doing that. Well, somebody hurt my feelings. Well, this person, I had a disagreement with them. I didn't like this. I didn't like that. That's no reason to walk away from Christ. He says, keep pressing ahead. Remove that sin from your life because God wants you in heaven. After our text, the Hebrew writer gives them some strong encouragement. Verse number nine, beloved, we are confident of better things concerning you. Yes, things that accompany salvation, though we speak in this manner. You see, he wants to get them to heaven and feels the same about you. That's good news for us today. It's time for us to spend some time in the workshop with Troy Spradlin. He's repairing our understanding about the parable of the prayer of the tax collector in Luke 18. The inspired writer Luke records Jesus saying that two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector in Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. 
And of these two men, the Pharisee boasted pridefully uh, while he was praying, even thanking God that he wasn't as that tax collector. It's a rather shocking and sad prayer to say the least. Well, meanwhile, the tax collector who was reviled in Jewish society was standing afar off and would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now, of these two men that Jesus used as an example, he said this of the tax collector. I'll tell you, this man went down to his house justified. So what does Jesus mean by justified? Is he saying that the tax collector is saved by saying that prayer? Is this an example of the sinner's prayer? Well, why don't we repair our understanding and find out? You see, first of all, the word justified means to declare or pronounce one to be just or righteous. I like how some people like to say that the word justified means that God looks at me just if I'd never sinned. So this tax collector was pleading with God to have mercy on him because he was a sinner. He had committed an injustice. So we can easily infer that the result of the man's prayer was God counted him as righteous. In other words, he's no longer a sinner when he left the temple. But as always, context plays a significant role in the correct understanding of any passage. Notice how Luke describes Jesus' teaching. He says, He spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Now, why did Luke put that information in there? Well, it was to give us context. You see, this is a lesson about pride, not about salvation. And also, these two men were Jewish, and they were in that temple praying. These are not some unbelievers asking God to accept them or to save them. They're already part of God's chosen people. They're already in a covenant relationship with Him, according to passages like Deuteronomy 14, verse 2, and so forth. And so these men are there in the temple praying. And here's the reality. Sometimes God's faithful people like the Jews back then and even Christians today can sin and need to be justified. 1 John 1 verse 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now John is writing to Christians, people who are already saved. He's not writing to unbelievers who are seeking salvation. And that's the same application as we see here in the tax collector's prayer. He had sinned and was praying for forgiveness. So this is not an example of the sinner's prayer in the Bible. So no matter how much those who believe or claim that it is, even ridiculing some of us who disagree with them, doesn't make their claim true. They're completely ignoring the context and reading something into the passage that simply isn't there, and that's primarily the word salvation. You see, the tax collector was not asking to be saved. He knew he had sinned, so he had asked God simply through humble supplication to forgive him. And in addition, we no longer live under that old covenant like the Jews did. That was strictly for them. Instead, in the new covenant, as Jesus calls it in Luke 22, verse 20, if someone wants to be saved and be part of God's family, meaning justified, then they must obey the gospel according to Acts 22, 16, 2 Thessalonians 1, 8, Romans 6, 17, and many more passages. So in the end, it's an abuse of the Bible to try and make this prayer of the tax collector a statement of what an alien sinner must do to be saved. Friend, just saying a prayer will not save you. You have to do something, and that is simply respond to God's commands for being saved of hearing, believing, repenting, confessing, and being baptized. And if you do that, then according to Acts chapter 2, verse 47, God will then add you to His church. Context is critically important as we attempt to understand what a passage of Scripture means. Thanks for that excellent job, Troy. Well, it's time to grab a piece of paper and something to write with so that you can take down our contact information. You can use it to enroll in our free Bible course. It's graded by one of the many volunteer teachers 
from the Dunlap Church of Christ. They oversee this work. Those volunteers do an excellent job, and we truly appreciate their efforts. You can also contact us and ask us a question. We love to hear from our audience, and we have a volunteer that does a great job in answering those questions, in addition to our speakers that answer many of them during the program. Jim Dearman's going to join us after this free offer. You may have questions or comments about Good News Today. We'd like to hear from you. Or if you would like to receive free Bible study materials, please contact us. Our mailing address is Good News Today, P.O. Box 206, Dunlap, Tennessee, 37327. Again, that's Good News Today, P.O. Box 206, Dunlap, Tennessee, 37327. You may prefer to email us at goodnewstodaytv at gmail.com. That's goodnewstodaytv at gmail.com. Or call us toll free at 1-877-384-7221. That's 1-877-384-7221. We'd like to hear from you. Hearing from our audience is always good news to us. You can always go to our website, click where it says Bible Course, fill out the information, and we'll get it to you. You can hear good news today on Truth.fm, a group of internet radio stations that are going 24-7. They have a Good News Today channel. Check them out, www.truth.fm. Now here's Jim Dearman with some sound words for us about silliness, stupidity, and sin. We live in a time when many do not like the word sin. They substitute other less offensive terms for the word sin. Words like stupid or silly. Saying something like, that was a silly thing to do, sounds a lot better than that was a sinful thing to do. Before man can be cleansed from sin, he must first confess that he is a sinner. Then he must come to God through Jesus Christ for forgiveness. Sin dishonors God and deprives the soul of heaven unless the blood of Jesus eradicates it. He has made his cleansing blood available to all who will come to him through obedience to his teaching, turning their backs on sin and turning to God. Stupidity and silliness do not adequately describe the seriousness of sin. Eternal separation and suffering present an accurate picture. Whether or not you're in that picture in eternity depends on your reaction to sin and your response to the Savior now. We will live eternally if we obey someone. Thanks, Jim. Why not keep the influence of Good News Today helping you every day in your battle against sin in your life? You can watch our programs on demand in several different ways. We have apps for your phone, television, and tablet. All of these are available from the App Store for free. Our program is also seen on YouTube and Facebook, so you can catch it there as well. You can see entire programs or individual segments on demand. It's time for us to head over to the Pastime Porch for a visit with Joe Guy. He's got some truths from the timeless text for us about useless knowledge. Well, hello. Thanks for stopping by. You know, I distinctly remember how much I used to hate football practice in high school. Even through Little League, all the way through high school, I hated the heat, the work, especially the 40-yard sprints after practice. I would often try to find ways to avoid practice, but I was rarely successful since my dad made sure that I was there fulfilling my role on the team. But when game time rolled around, all that heat and sweat, the coaches yelling, and even the sprints were worth it. I knew the plays, I knew my responsibilities, and I found I could actually do more and perform better than I even realized. Now, I have fond memories of my time with my teammates and coaches, and all those years of hard, uncomfortable work, well, it was worth it. We forget sometimes that tough times, hard work, and even suffering actually makes us better. A lot of people try to avoid hard work or taking a courageous stand and just take the easy way out. That's what Peter did when he denied Christ. He tried to avoid the responsibility of even being on Jesus' side, flat denying that he even knew him at all. 
But when Jesus looked at him from across the high priest's courtyard in Luke 22, 61 and 62, Peter knew how bad he had failed. So it's interesting. It's Peter himself, a man who once took the easy way out to avoid suffering, to encourage being strong as he does in 1 Peter chapter 1. In verses 6 through 9, he says that we should rejoice if we suffer for a little while, if we're suffering for being faithful. Because, he says, suffering has a point. It tests our faith like gold being made pure by fire. Suffering gives faith strength and makes it genuine, as we see in Psalms 139, 22 through 24, and in James chapter 1, verse 2. You may know that the Navy SEALs train on a concept of 40%. They say that when a person feels like they have given all they can physically and mentally give, they actually have only used up 40% of their strength. We still have 60% of our ability remaining. So when we endure suffering through problems, we often find that like gold purified by fire, we're stronger than we thought we were. Like in 1 Corinthians 10, verse 13. And we have an example of, of Christ given in Matthew 5, 44 and 1 Corinthians 4, 12 through 13. Peter says in chapter 1, verse 9, focus on the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. Peter had made the mistake of trying to take the easy way out, and he personally knew the failure of doing so. He more than most understood the value of enduring troubles and focusing on his salvation over any other difficulty facing him. Friends, difficulties will come. We just have to ask ourselves, what are we focused on? There's so much encouragement in the timeless text of the Bible. Let's use it to make ourselves stronger. I'm Joe Guy. Thank you for visiting. May I have just a minute of your time? I once read about a 13-year-old boy who, in a determination to fly, tied 42 helium balloons to a lawn chair. He took several supplies, including a BB gun, for strategically eliminating balloons when he was ready to descend. But when his friends released him, he began ascending at over 1,000 feet per minute and reached an altitude of 16,000 feet where he was spotted by an airline pilot. He began to shoot out balloons. Then he dropped his BB gun. Thankfully, to sum up a longer story, he ended up safe despite being tangled in some power lines. But that boy's flight reminds me of the flight of sin. Sin promises so much, but delivers so little. As one preacher put it, Sin thrills, and then it kills. Moses understood this. Hebrews 11.25 tells us he chose to suffer with God's people instead of enjoying the pleasures of sin for a season. Don't be fooled, folks. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 6.23. I'm Chad Dollahypes, and this is Just a Minute. Thanks, Chad. In just a moment, we have a Bible question for Anthony Dismuke and Troy Spradlin. Now we have a Bible question for Anthony and Troy. What's the difference between a public sin and a private sin? What is the difference between a public sin and a private sin is the question that we have today, Troy. Well, that is a great question because really good. I think there's a lot of people that don't really understand the difference or really the response to uh, what they should do about that sin. Mm -hmm. 
Yes, a lot of people might have a question about when, you know, when I do a public, when I have a public sin or when I have a private sin, what am I supposed to do? When should I go before the congregation? When should I just pray to God alone and allow that to be between us? And so maybe that's some of the reason why uh, this question has been brought up. Mm -hmm. Well, we see some of that, for example, in Matthew chapter 18, where you have a sin that was it's still private, even though it's between two people. And then it becomes public. In Matthew 18, verse 15, moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. So that's mm -hmm. still in a private matter just between two people. Right. But then what happens if they don't respond properly? Well, then you need to take it before more witnesses and then take it before the church. So something that was private becomes public. That's right. You know, and so there are some sins where we need to go before the congregation and and make that known that we have changed our ways and, mm -hmm. and we're looking to turn our lives around. But then there's other ones where, you know, that might not even be necessary for you to go before the congregation uh, right. and you need to handle that elsewhere. So public sins don't always mean that you have to come before the congregation. You might come before the congregation because, you know, you need help in that area and you're, you, you need the prayers of the saints yes. uh, in that regard, but you need to make sure you take care of the sin uh, that you've committed with the people who you've transgressed against. Great point. Such a great point. And as you mentioned, there are some things that are private in our lives that's just between you and God. You mm -hmm. need to, as we read about in 1 John chapter 1, verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all righteousness. That's the key. Whether it's public or private, you need to make sure you're handling it correctly. You either handle it directly before God or handle it before the people you sinned against or bring it in front of the church. Right. Great point. And, and you know, Ananias and Sapphira and Acts 5 were found in that way. They, they planned. They had a plan. And, you know, it became public knowledge. And they were unwilling to repent. Yes. Unwilling to confess. And yes. so, therefore, a uh, public demonstration was made of them because— they were unwilling to do that. Mm -hmm. God doesn't handle us in the same way now, but ultimately we will have to pay for that of which we are unwilling to repent of. That's exactly right. So the difference between public sin and private sin is what you do that is between you and God versus what you do that other people know about. That's right. That's right. Nonetheless, we have to make sure we do our best to confess it, repent of it, change our ways. Amen. Great answer, guys. Sin is a problem for everyone, Romans 3.23. And there's only one solution to it, and that would be the blood of Christ, Colossians 1.14. Remember, we love you, we're praying for you, and we want you to make it to heaven. All around the world.